Turkey condemns Israel's attack on the Turkish-Palestinian Friendship Hospital in Gaza as Israel begins its ground assault into the besieged enclave. Plus, the UN General Assembly adopts a resolution for a ceasefire in Gaza, despite more than a dozen no votes. That included the US. What will the diplomatic fallout be? I'll break it all down here on Straight Talk. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Aisha Subarkash. After three weeks of continuous bombardment from the air, Israeli ground forces began their incursion into Gaza in what Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu declared the second phase of the war. Just as Israeli troops were moving in, the UN General Assembly passed a Jordanian-led resolution calling for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire as well as the release of all hostages held by Hamas. 14 countries, including the U.S. and Israel, voted against the measure, with Netanyahu rejecting any calls for a ceasefire. Meanwhile, Turkey has been increasing its criticism of Israel's disproportionate use of force, which has overwhelmingly affected civilians. President Erdogan addressed a pro-Palestinian rally in Istanbul on the eve of the nation's centenary celebrations, saying that he will declare Israel as a war criminal. Ankara also strongly condemned an attack on the Turkish-Palestinian Friendship Hospital in Gaza on Monday. More than 8,000 Palestinians have been killed by Israeli airstrikes, which were launched in response to an attack by Hamas on October the 7th. And now to discuss the latest developments from Gaza. Joining me now from London is Chris Doyle. He is the director at the Council for Arab-British Understanding. From Berlin, Anisha Patel. She's a senior legal researcher at Law for Palestine. And from Istanbul, Mehmet Çelik. He's an editorial coordinator at Daily Sabah. A warm welcome to you all and thanks for joining me on Straight Talk. So, Anisha, it's been almost a month since Israel has started bombing Gaza, which has overwhelmingly targeted civilians. Over 8,000 uh, people have been killed, 3,000 of which have been unfortunately children. So what we have been witnessing so far and where is this headed? Well, um, to put it straightforward, uh, we are witnessing a genocide unfolding. And I don't say this rhetor rhetorically, I say this in the most legal sense because legally genocide has two components to it. One is intent, which we have seen extensive intent uh, being expressed by officials at all levels in the Israeli forces. The other component is obviously the acts that we have seen unfolding, the brutality of the violence that has been um, thrusted upon the Palestinians in Gaza since 7th of October cannot be described as anything except the intention of kind of eliminating uh, the people from Gaza. Along with this, we have also seen other statements that look at kind of moving the population outside of Gaza, clearing the territory and so on and so forth. So to, uh, other than war crimes and crimes against humanity that include uh, starvation of the population, of cutting of medical supplies and blocking yes. humanitarian aid, this is actually genocide. So on Friday, unfolding. yes. So on Friday, uh, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution for an urgent, durable and permanent humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza. 120 countries voted in favor, 14 against, 45 abstained. Among the 14 countries that voted against a ceasefire were Israel and the U.S., while several EU members supported the ceasefire, four member states voted no. The resolution put forward by Jordan on behalf of 22 Arab countries isn't legally binding. Israel dismissed the measure while Hamas called for the implementation of the resolution. So, Mehmet, since the General Assembly resolutions are not binding, will this latest one have any effect on whatsoever on the Israeli brutality in Gaza? Well, actually, it seems that it doesn't have any effect, uh, actually. But, I mean, if we look at it uh, from uh, the actions of Israelis after this resolution, uh, we see that there is no effect. However, I think it creates this uh, uh, public opinion in the international community that would put pressure on some of the countries that have voted yes on influencing Israel uh, uh, maybe uh, for a ceasefire or, or at least to pay more attention to the civilian ca casualties, which has been, as my as the previous speaker said, you know, at the very simplest term, very simplest way of explaining it, it is a genocide. 
Um, however, you know, all these resolutions, and this is not the first resolution condemning Israeli uh, atrocities against the Palestinians. There's, you know, hundreds of resolutions that Israel hasn't uh, paid attention to. But I think in line with, uh, in addition to these resolutions, I mean, if we look at even the protests, yes. do they actually turn into some sort of policy change in the countries, particularly in the West, in the U.S., uh, in the European countries, do they translate into something that is more tangible? So far, they haven't yet. But I think that public pressure, be it at the protest level, yes. be it at the individual level, or at the international platform, I think it is necessary to put pressure on Israel and the countries that support Israel. So, Chris, uh, would you agree with what Mehmet said? I mean, can we say that global public opinion from ordinary people to all the way to governments is moving against Israel and the United States? Global public opinion has for a long time been appalled by the way in which Gaza has been treated. Remember that this is the sixth major military Israeli bombardment of Gaza. And I think what a lot of people fail to realize in Western political leaderships is the huge level of awareness of what Gaza was like prior to the 7th of October. So there is a lot of anger that they know, the global public, that Gaza was no heaven uh, before all of this started. It was already a population in overcrowded slums, 80% aid-dependent, drinking water that animals shouldn't be drinking. And then you have now seen it being reduced to a new level of hell. What I think we are seeing at UN General Assembly is the very stark divisions between the global South and European states and the United States. Mm -hmm. And there mm -hmm. is a stunning uh, amount of anger at the hypocrisy and double standards that are on view, where it was European states and the United States, when it came to Russia invading and occupying parts of Ukraine, that took a very strong position rooted in international law, opposing that invasion, opposing the occupation, opposing using siege as a weapon of war, starvation as a weapon of war. But when it comes to one of their allies, Israel, and doing it to the Palestinians, there yeah. is only a fig leaf uh, element of uh, adhering to international law, some references to it, but never the specific crimes. And as Anissa was saying, there's a very strong argument about the crime of genocide being committed right now. Yes. So, Anisha, Turkish President uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan has been very vocal uh, about his criticism of the Israeli uh, airstrikes and has taken it as far as uh, to introduce Israel to the, war, uh, to the world as a war criminal. What's your take on that? And what kind of legal steps could Turkey take in this regard? Um, yes. Um, there are... I mean, there are things that uh, that need to be done instantly, but there are legal steps such as uh, the application of universal jurisdiction is something that Turkey could do, where you can actually uh, prosecute criminals that have committed war crimes and crimes against humanity, even if they are not your uh, citizens or on your territory. The other thing that can be done is bringing a case against uh, Israel at the International Court of Justice, which is uh, the court that is uh, kind of in charge of looking at the crimes of genocide. And similar things have been done uh, for the Ukraine and Russia situation. Mm -hmm. The Gambia has brought a case against Myanmar. So the possibilities of uh, kind of legally prosecuting uh, people and states for war crimes is open. And according to the Genocide Convention, it is incumbent on third states to actually take these legal steps to address mm -hmm. these war crimes. So, uh, Mehmet, following Ankara's uh, reaction, Israel's uh, Foreign Minister Eli Cohen released a statement in which he said, given the grave statements coming from Turkey, I've ordered the return of diplomatic representatives there in order to conduct a re-evaluation of the relations between Israel and Turkey. So the two countries were on a positive, rather positive trajectory this year, but has that process all but stopped now? Well, I think, it, you know, to say the very least, it has been uh, put to freeze. Uh, that normalization that many saw uh, as a positive step, not just for uh, from the bilateral level, but also at a regional level, is now, no, it, I mean, we can't say that it uh, uh, any longer exists. I mean, 
we can we can also acknowledge that President Erdogan's rhetoric in the very beginning um, of these uh, attacks were not as harsh as they are right now. Mm -hmm. um, I think President Erdogan didn't, uh, you know, wanted to see whether this will go any further uh, uh, in terms of atrocities against the people in Gaza or whether Israel will put a stop. But the fact that Israel sees no limits um, in, in crimes against uh, uh, civilians in Gaza, President Erdogan is one of the, you know, very vocal and very active defenders of the Palestinian struggle, had to put his foot on the ground and, and say that this is not something that Turkey uh, will accept diplomatically at the very least. So. Despite that, there is that harsh tone, there is that disconnect and diplomatic ties at the moment. Turkey still proposes some sort of tangible uh, uh, solutions that, mm -hmm. you know, can contribute to uh, establishment of some sort of ceasefire. Uh, you know, it has called for a guarantor model uh, that could be put to place after a ceasefire. It has called for a, a peace conference. It has uh, been sending... Uh, uh, aid uh, to to uh, to Gaza, uh, including uh, medical personnel. Actually, uh, uh, First Lady uh, Amina Erdogan has also has um, made this proposal where uh, Turkey would receive or would host some of the uh, uh, Palestinian uh, babies yes. so that they can get treatment in Turkey as well. So there is that. Yes, there is that very hard diplomatic confrontation, but there is also tangible proposals uh, uh, to find a solution to this problem as well because. Turkey does not see the Gaza problem as an as a problem that ex, that exists yes. beyond its border at a distant level. So, Chris, how could Turkey and Qatar's efforts, as uh, Mehmet just briefly mentioned, to secure a deal on the release of hostages uh, play out as tensions between Turkey and Israel continue to es escalate? And do you also believe that there is um, back-channel diplomacy going on between Ankara and Tel Aviv? It's very important to try to find some sort of way of getting those hostages released. This is obviously one of the big motivating factors of the Israeli uh, actions, but it's not the only one. And this is why, actually, I think a ceasefire is so important, because a ceasefire provides that window to try to get some of those hostages, hopefully all, released. It provides a window also to get humanitarian access, full humanitarian access into Gaza, mm -hmm. and hopefully to build for a longer lasting uh, solution. Well, if you don't have a ceasefire, we're going to get a full ground invasion. Probably most of those hostages will get killed very awfully. And you also risk the further regional escalation in all of this, perhaps with Hezbollah in the north. So this is why it's so foolhardy for uh, Western political leaders to stop a ceasefire, not to back it. Mm -hmm. I think that there are back channels. I think the Qataris have been attempting to do it. But I think Hamas wants to get something for such a deal, for the release of those hostages. And the question is, is there a particular price that Israel in particular is willing you know, to pay? To uh, It would, in its own eyes, risk being seen to reward Hamas for what it's done. Um, Hamas will want to have something in return for the release of those Israelis. So, Anisha, International Criminal Court Prosecutor Karim Khan has called on Israel to make discernible efforts to ensure civilians can uh, access uh, food and medicine. He also said impeding the delivery of humanitarian relief could give rise to criminal responsibility under the Rome Statute. So how serious is this warning, given the all international organizations' inaction to what's been happening in Gaza? I mean, this is a question that all states uh, should be asking because this investigation has been open since 2000, uh, 2021 and um, Palestine has been a party to the convention since 2014. It is only now that the prosecutor actually makes a statement about this and calls uh, this a possibility of uh, a war crime. Whereas the United Nations Commission of Inquiry has already mentioned a few days ago that it is, uh, it, with the evidence that it has, that it uh, believes there are war crimes being committed and the evidence has been shared with the ICC already. Um, when, again, looking at the situation in Ukraine and um, Russia, the prosecutor's office actually set up an investigative team inside Ukraine with over 40 investigators and even issued an arrest warrant in this 
in the situation. And the Palestinian situation is not something that started on the 7th of October. It has been on for 75 years. So for the sake of the credibility of the ICC more than anything else at this point, uh, the prosecutor needs to do more than just issue statements saying this may be a So what's crime. the way moving forward? I mean, what sort of steps uh, could the ICC take to stop Israel from attacking uh, civilians? I mean, what's needed? Uh, there is a need for pressure from the third states that uh, kind of state that there will be no impunity for these actions. Mm -hmm. There has to be a call for immediate ceasefire. There has to be accountability. There has to be arrest warrants given out. There has to be uh, kind of action from everybody to just stop what is happening right now. Mm -hmm. The delivery of aid is it, it's impossible that this situation continues and everybody just sits and debates what the legal framework for this may be. We have those legal frameworks. We have seen them being applied in Ukraine instantly. We have seen the third states, especially the states that have leverage in this situation, which is mostly um, America and its allies and the Western states at large, actually come and act. There are arms embargoes that need to be applied. And all these are not new things. These things have been done yes. before in different situations. So why not here is the question. So Mehmet, uh, meanwhile, US President Joe Biden has said Egypt and the US have agreed on the need to significantly increase the delivery of humanitarian aid to Gaza and ensure Gazans are not displaced to Egypt or to any other country. What's your take on that? And where would some 1.4 million internally displaced Palestinians go? You know, I, I always find it very, very tragic that no one says, you know, I mean, the, these people that are looking for a solution, where these Gazan would go, um, and, and they, you know, they, they they find that to be a solution rather than asking Israel to stop this, you know, displacing the Gazans. I think there is a problem, you know, uh, an ontological problem there that should be questioned. The Gazans should not be leaving Gaza. The bombing should be stopping instead. So the problem is, the, you know, the fact that they are saying they should be maybe opening a, a new area in Egypt or elsewhere for the Gazans, or even within Gaza, between northern Gaza and southern Gaza. I mean, why should that be even part of the discussion when the actual problem is the bombing of Gaza by Israel? Mm -hmm. I think there is a problem. There is a problem, political problem there. There is a, you know. This is not the solution to displace Gaza. Now, what will happen to Gaza once uh, these uh, the, the Gazans leave Gaza? Will that turn into something uh, like the Nakba uh, uh, previously, when they could return back to Gaza and they're not able to, uh, uh, you know, put a key in their uh, the, the door of their homes? I think there is a huge problem in that narrative itself that the Gazans should be leaving their homes. The actual problem is the bombing, the occupation, yes. dispossession, and displacement of Palestinians from their homes. So, Chris, as for the increased uh, delivery of humanitarian aid to uh, Gaza, uh, is this agreement between Egypt and the U.S. a accomplishment? Is Israel also on board this agreement? And, of course, I'll just add this, this one too. So, with allowing dozens of aid trucks to into Gaza help alleviate the human catastrophe in the besieged enclave? We need far more than just the delivery of a few trucks. And it's incredible to see the United States, on the one hand, it's donating aid, bread and water to, to the people of Gaza, but on the other hand, it's supplying the very bombs that are dropping on their homes, their bakeries, their water facilities, their power facilities. So it, it it's completely uh, absurd situation uh, that we're in at the moment. But, you know, you need a ceasefire in order for that aid to be distributed. And look, there were 500 trucks going into Gaza every single day, and that was before the increased need as a result of this bombing. Yes. We're getting yes. 2 to 3 percent of the, that need. Imagine being part of the United Nations and having to decide who gets the bottled water, who gets the food, who, who lives that day and who dies, because that's essentially what the situation we put them into. And there is a danger here that we could send loads of uh, aid and humanitarian goods in trucks to Rafa. But if you're not allowed to be able to get it in without being bombarded, 
uh, with the knowledge you can distribute it, then it's just going to be sitting there on the Egyptian side of the border, whilst people are dying on the other side of the border from hunger, thirst and disease. Mm -hmm. So, Anisha, what do you think? Is the U.S. playing along with uh, the Egyptian uh, position, which was very clear uh, from the beginning of this conflict, that it does not want to see this conflict spill over? I, I think um, that it is a very fair position that it does not want to have the conflict spill over for many reasons. Uh, one, because of the security situation there, but two, uh, like one of the previous speakers mentioned, there is a the history has told us that this uh, the spillover of conflict will mean that the Palestinians do not get to go back into their own lands. And this is, legally speaking, ethnic cleansing. And um, America, if supporting this position, is actually complicit in this process. So I think that this uh, is something that is very, very critical to the conversation, that we don't actually give in to this idea. Mm. So, Mehmet, another warning came from France. Uh, French President Emmanuel Macron has condemned the rising violence uh, by Jewish settlers against Palestinians in the occupied West Bank. Is there still time for Western countries and their allies to change their positions uh, towards Israel's oppression? Look, I know that all the eyes, all eyes are rightfully and, and for very good reasons are turned to Gaza, Gaza at the moment. Yeah. But I think the situation, the situation in the West Bank, West Bank, the occupation that has been going on for for many decades, it's something. Or or the the situation in East Jerusalem in El Quds, I think that is something that sh we should not put aside, and it should be part of the whole Palestinian uh, discussion. Um, and, you know, specifically in the very recent days, I think tensions are very high in, in West Bank. Today, one of the, you know, I mean, many, more than 100 people have been killed so far since the October 7th. But this situation in West Bank or East Jerusalem or elsewhere in the occupied ter territories is not something that should be put aside or, it is, you know, life is not normal uh, outside of Gaza for the Palestinians. So Having said mm -hmm. that, I think mm -hmm. that you know, that uh, uh, um, tension in, in places like West Bank, it's, it is going to be very dangerous, I think, if the situation in Gaza does not change for the Palestinians. So, Chris, uh, over the weekend, a group of anti-Jewish rioters uh, stormed an airport in Russia's uh, Dagestan Autonomous Region in an attempt to confront Israeli passengers who were reported their broader flight uh, from Israel. So, could this be construed as an isolated incident, or are there risks that similar incidents could spread to other parts of Russia as well as the world? I very much hope, hope not. It, it's certainly not what we want to see. We don't want to see um, this sort of uh, demonstrations against people because of their identity, whether it's because they're Jewish or Muslim or, or, or look Arab or look Israeli. I mean, I think that is a very dangerous situation and where, where we get to. I think there is a massive, massive responsibility of political leaderships to emphasize that Jews are not responsible for what the Israeli government is doing any more than, say, Muslims were responsible for what ISIS Daesh Islamic State used to do. And it is really, really important that politicians act responsibly. Part of that responsibility, though, is also to call for that ceasefire and to call to the end of that bombing and the inhumanitarian uh, elements of what we're seeing there. But I would appeal to people that actually conducting what we saw in, in, in Dagestan is not the way forward. Yes. That is not a way to to respond to to, to the events in, in Gaza and what Israel is doing. That's a, a, a very worrying uh, step. I hope it doesn't get repeated anywhere else. It's Sorry. wrong. OK, so, Anisha, a very quick question. I mean, how has this assault on Gaza exposed the uh, deep-running divisions within uh, Israel? And what do you make of hundreds of Israelis who have been protesting Netanyahu over his policies and his inability to secure the release of the Israeli hostages? Um, I think this has done two things. One, it has kind of exposed 
the divisions further because now we start uh, seeing that there are actually families calling for the release of uh, their family members who have been held hostage. Uh, but at the same time, oh, it has also brought sorry, it has also brought uh, kind of this entire narrative of the judicial overhaul and the protests that we had seen over the last few months uh, raging mm -hmm. put to the side because there have been now legislations enforced where uh, protesting is uh, kind of out of question. Yes. So we're seeing uh, this acting in two ways, people who've been affected and are uh, kind of calling for a change in direction, but also a large number of people are now uh, visibly shaken and mm -hmm. correctly so. All right, Anisha, Mehmet and Chris, unfortunately, we'll have to leave it here. Thank you very much for joining me on Straight Talk. And thank you for watching this edition of Straight Talk. Be sure to share your thoughts with us on X at Straight Talk TRT. And don't forget to like, share and subscribe to our YouTube channel. From me, Aisha Subarkash and the team, take care and goodbye.